This is Claudio Celani. I'm uh, interviewing Marco Zanni, who is in uh, Strasbourg at the European Parliament. And Zanni is the uh, president of the Identity and Democracy faction in the European Parliament. He is also the foreign policy spokesman of the Lega, the Italian opposition party. And uh, he's a known figure for our uh, audience, LPAC. He has already uh, given interviews to us in the past. Now, Marco, how are you? I'm fine. Hello, Claudio, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be back with you. Okay, I take my glasses out so that I can <laughs> see better. Well, Marco, um, my idea was to explain to our international audience and American audience in particular the debate going on in the European Union now concerning the so-called banking union, but especially the debate around the European stability mechanism. This is a fund uh, which is supposed to bail out banks and governments. Um, and uh, there has been a strong debate in Italy and uh, your party uh, uh, took an opposition stand, a critical stand. Can you explain to us why, what is this fund uh, and what, why are you against it? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, actually, the debate about uh, the reform of, of this uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, bailout fund, uh, is it has been one of the main topics uh, into the political arena uh, of Italy and the European Union in the past uh, weeks, so it's a very important issue. Uh, we have to come back to uh, the sovereign debt crisis of 2010, that affected strongly the Eurozone and Eurozone countries, especially the so-called peaks, uh, so mainly Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, and uh, uh, the Republic of uh, uh, Ireland. Uh, at that time, the Eurozone was really in danger uh, because uh, uh, basically the wrong architecture of the common currency and the fact that uh, uh, this architecture was not able uh, to give member states uh, instruments and flexibility to uh, respond uh, to the challenges of the financial crisis and sovereign crisis that uh, uh, burned into uh, the European Union in 2010. So uh, in 2012, uh, the European governments decided to set up uh, this uh, uh, bailout fund that was not supposed to bail out banks, but to give support uh, uh, to the sustainability or refinancing of public debts uh, of uh, Eurozone countries in troubles. So the aim in 2012 of the European Stability Mechanism was, or at least that uh, uh, was how the European institution marketed this fund, was to support member states in trouble. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, uh, the fund uh, took over some bilateral loans made by member states to Greece, to the Greek government, but mainly the main action of the fund in 2012 was to buy back Greek public debt from uh, French and German banks that were heavily exposed to the debt, public debt of uh, 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 Greece as a Eurozone country. So uh, basically in 2012, we set up this fund that was supposed to bail out uh, states and, and to support mainly Greece and Greek people in a very difficult moment, but in the end, and that was confirmed also by Il Sole 24 Ore, the main financial newspaper in, uh, in Italy, that in the end, uh, they found uh, bailed out French and German banks. Only 5% of the money committed by the ESM to Greece uh, went to the Greece people. The rest was used to buy back the uh, the uh, government Greek debt uh, in the in in the balance sheet of of uh, Greek uh, of German and French banks. So that was what the funding 
did. Uh, it was not a fund to support country, but it was just a fund to shift the loss incurred by private banks, namely German and French banks, from, from their balance sheets, so private balance sheets, to public balance sheets, because the ESM was funded by contribution of member states. So Italy at that time committed uh, 15 billion euros and uh, the, the, in 2013, a total of 60 billion euros to support the fund, to bail out French and German banks in a period, uh, in an historical period where uh, the um, narrative in the Eurozone was that uh, uh, Italy uh, would have not been able to pay for its debts, to pay pensions uh, to Italian people, to pay salaries to public administration. That was the narrative of Mr. Monti. So in a time when the government of Mr. Monti uh, delivered the pension reform to catch pensions to Italian people, the Italian Treasury paid out 15 billion euros to the ESM to bail out German and French banks. That was uh, uh, the reality about uh, the European stability mechanism. Then uh, the, the, uh, the ESM also supported uh, Spain, Portugal, Ireland uh, and Cyprus as Euro other Eurozone countries in trouble, year passed and problems of the Eurozone uh, became uh, um, tough, became uh, uh, evident also to common people. So in 2017, in a package to discuss reform of the Eurozone and Eurozone institution, uh, mainstream parties and politicians and, and Brussels bureaucrats decided to put forward a proposal to transform the European stability mechanism in a sort of uh, uh, European uh, um, uh, European uh, uh, fund, a sort of uh, 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 European monetary fund, a, a similar uh, institution than uh, to the IMF. That was not possible because the opposition uh, of, uh, um, of um, because lack of agreement in the council between member states about transforming the ESM into a sort of uh, uh, institutionalized troika. So they decided to put forward a different path. So a reform of the European stability mechanism. So um, the Eurogroup, so it's a council that uh, uh, is composed by the 19 uh, Eurozone finance ministers, uh, started working uh, uh, on a term sheet uh, to reform, to agree reform the, uh, of the European stability mechanism uh, following uh, two uh, principles. The first principle was to allow the bail-in or the restructuring of public debt of Eurozone member states, keeping the member states inside the Eurozone. So that means a bail-in of public debt holders. That means a bail-in mainly of uh, uh, private savers and uh, basically all also the in financial institutions that invested in the public debt of Eurozone country. And the second, uh, just, just to finish, the second part of the reform uh, was uh, the creation of a sort of a backstop for the single resolution fund that is a fund created uh, under the banking union umbrella to uh, intervene in case of a banking crisis. So it's one of the pillar of the so-called banking union that is composed by the common supervisory mechanism at the Eurozone level, the uh, common resolution mechanism with the uh, common resolution fund attached, and the third pillar that has not been agreed, a common deposit insurance. So this backstop should have functioned as a sort of safety net for Eurozone banks. So is I, is, if I understand correctly, in the case of Greece, they were against the bail-in of private creditors because this would have uh, penalized 
French and German banks. But now in the case of Italy, for example, if Italy needs aid, then they should bail in their creditors who are basically Italian banks. So uh, in this, this time, yes, they and that, accept it. That, and, that, that's more or less what, what, what happened in the past. Uh, investors in Greek pri uh, public debt incurred losses, but uh, not uh, the uh, full losses that they should have incurred. Uh, so basically, uh, French and German banks speculated on Greek debts because before 2010, uh, with the common currency, was uh, uh, very profitable for them to fund their um, balance sheet, uh, uh, considering German and French interest rates, and invest this money in uh, um, uh, more profitable um, financial instrument as Greek debt was at that time offering interest rates uh, um, higher than uh, German Bund or the French OAT. Uh, so basically that's the difference. At that time uh, we had to uh, contribute, we as Italy, uh, Italian taxpayers had to contribute uh, to the bailout, to the ind indirect bailout uh, of German and French banks. And now we have, with, with this reform, in case of necessity, we should uh, or we will be forced to bail in our uh, citizens that invested money in BTP. Okay, but then let, let me address the other aspect because this is, uh, I, in my impression, the big change. Now the ESM is officially becoming a safety net for banks. Before it was officially for states, but we saw that in reality it was for banks. But now it is officially for banks because of this backstop thing. So in other words, first they will use this single resolution mechanism, which I think is not yeah. yet filled. It's a few million there. This is the banks, right? No, that should be planned uh, by 2024. So this is a bank, bank, their own bank funded, net. bank funded fund that should uh, support resolution of, of uh, failing or likely to fail right, right. banks. Oh, and this, accordingly to, to EU regulation, uh, uh, the total amount in the fund should reach 55 billion euro, but just in 2014, 2014. Uh, 2024, sorry. 2024. So, so the, the backstop should intervene in case this fund is not sufficient to, uh, is not enough to support the resolution of a bank in the European Union. But it's just a fake fund because uh, if you look at uh, uh, the huge amount of money committed by European governments uh, uh, for restructuring banks uh, during the big financial crisis that we suffered uh, in 2008 and 2010, uh, I mean, just for Germany, uh, direct recapitalization by the German government and uh, guarantee that uh, the German government committed to banks, uh, considering just Germany, uh, we are talking uh, of about 400 billion euros for French, 250. So for the World Banking Union, we are talking at that time of about 1,000 billion euro. So do you think that uh, a 55 billion fund uh, with uh, an additional 63 billion safety net or so supposed safety net will be sufficient uh, to stabilize our banking system or to uh, function as a safety net for our depositors? I don't think so. Well, let's remember that also the, the global system, including the European one, was, was built out by the Federal Reserve and they have calculated that they spend about 28 uh, uh, trillions or something like that. So, but this brings me to uh, to see the reality in which this debate takes place. And, you know, they have now urgency to complete the scheme in a situation where of the two uh, 
uh, dangers of the two risks, the private sector and the government, seems to me that the private sector is really the big risk ahead of us because uh, the financial system is again in a situation of comma. Um, we have our, our listeners uh, know that the, 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 the repo uh, system, the overnight uh, banking refinancing system is dead, has been dead since September. And the Federal Reserve is pumping every day liquidity in the system more and more, right? Uh, so uh, the the entire financial bubble is going to burst, and it seems to me this is the real risk we are we are going to face. And and that's the, the first uh, thing that that's this ESM, where the, whenever this is this is uh, you know going to be op operational, this is the first risk they're going to face. Now you th you think. Uh, uh, they, they will make it before the, the system blows up. <laughs> I mean, uh, nor uh, neither the the European institution or the ECB uh, are aware of the huge risks uh, that are inside our financial system. There are strong signs of uh, uh, stress. You mentioned the repo uh, and the liquidity crisis in the US. We have been also affected in the European Union. Uh, we have uh, uh, problems uh, because the ECB is refusing to assess properly the fair value of uh, illiquid asset level two and level three assets in the uh, balance sheets of European banks. So uh, basically European institutions are failing in uh, addressing the real problems of our economy of our financial system. They are putting uh, again emphasis uh, on the sustainability of public debt. European and especially Italian public debt is perfectly sustainable. We have uh, big risks in the private sector and, and the EU and the ECB, they are refusing to assess properly or to consider actions uh, to uh, to um, uh, tackle this huge risk that are evident to everyone now. So they will not react. They will not put on the table concrete proposal on this. Uh, as you know, the ESM is a complicated, me useless mechanism that is typical of the EU decision-making process. We have an instrument that is already in place and that could guarantee financial stability to our financial system is the ECB. We don't need the ESM to function as safety net or backstop. We have the ECB, central bank should do this, but in the Eurozone it's impossible. And uh, another part of the problem is regulation. We had uh, uh, since uh, 2010 a huge flow of regulation, financial regulation, but that regulation is not addressing the real problem. It's just trying to create buffers, capital buffers that are not enough to guarantee stability to our financial system. So we are basically acting, uh, just considering instruments that could absorb consequences of a financial crisis, but, but the history shows that uh, it's impossible to calculate before the consequences of financial crisis. So whatever the capital buffer uh, we will impose to banks, that will not be enough to face the next financial crisis. So what is the right way is to act on preventing financial crisis. That's a safe way to make our financial system sustainable. We are working and, and since 2014 uh, I, I'm working in the European Parliament and the, in the European institution to protect the safe part of our banks, the same part of our banks and separate what we don't need, what is a speculative banking that is just feeding a big financial bubble into our system. And in the end, the history shows that this bubble will burst and taxpayers will have to pay for the mistakes and speculations of bankers. 
Yes, uh, you are referring to bank separation and the famous Glass-Steagall Act. We have campaigned for that for years. And actually, we have helped starting a real debate after the financial crisis in the United States and in Europe. And I'm surprised that nobody now comes up uh, with this solution, especially in front of, uh, of, of this uh, uh, new crisis of the, of the financial system, which you, which you describe. But we have a, a, the case of a bank in Italy now, the Popolare di Bari, that maybe is uh, uh, exactly a case where one could, could uh, address the issue of bank separation. Is, is that correct? We, we had uh, several cases uh, in the European Union and in Italy of uh, uh, bad managed uh, um, banking crisis. So Banca Popolare di Bari is the last one. We have basically two problems related to this bank and, and other banking crises in Italy. One problem is related to supervision, supervisory authority. There is a, a huge responsibility of the uh, supervisory authority that for Banca Popolare di Bari is uh, the Italian central bank because they, uh, there is uh, something wrong or something went wrong in the process of supervising the bank. And I hope that uh, uh, the magistrature in Italy will tackle and will assess properly responsibility of the central bank. Because in the European Union, central banks, uh, uh, usually they hide themselves behind uh, the concept of independence. So they say uh, we are independent, so you cannot attack us because uh, of our mistakes in the supervision. But that's not correct. I don't agree with central bank independence. But OK, we have this uh, concept uh, in, in, in central banking in the world and, and also in Italy. But independence doesn't mean irresponsibility. So independence doesn't mean that uh, central bankers are not responsible for their mistakes. So that's a point. The other point uh, are banks uh, that in order to uh, increase the payouts to shareholders uh, and, and to increase uh, the bonus to the managers are leaving uh, the traditional banking activity to support and invest in more speculative financial instruments. That's not safe. That's not something that banks should do. And that's something that the public authority governments should address with proper banking separation. That's a very important pillar of safe financial system. I have two questions because um, our time is also running out. But I have two questions. The first is whether in the EU legislation as such, uh, bank separation can be introduced at national level because the EU has, uh, in 1989, they drafted what is today the universal banking model for the European, uh, for European under European law, the bank is de described as universal bank. So the, my first question is whether this can be changed at, at uh, um, at national level, or if a nation can introduce a, 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 a let's say, a, 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 a exception to this. My second question is: It seems to me that the authorities who should regulate and oversight are now in a, again in a new flight forward. They don't want to 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 regulate. Uh, they want to launch a new bubble to save the old bubble. Uh, and this is what I think is, is the entire discussion and proposal about the Green New Deal of the EU Commission, of the EU, European Central Bank, uh, and, and the financial markets, the hedge funds, they say this open. Yesterday there was an article by the, uh, by the head of Goldman Sachs, Mr. Solomon, who, who plainly said that they want to invest in the transition to the green economy. <clears throat> Uh, but this must be profitable for them, and this is going to be profitable through government subsidies. So they want governments and taxpayers to bail them out 
so they won't transfer money from from the taxpayers again into a new bubble. Is is that correct? As I see it. Yeah, you know, uh, Claudio, green is the color of money. <laughs> so <laughs> that that's a sign uh, that uh, there is something behind. Uh, uh, clearly, this uh, 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 green schizophrenia is uh, is uh, something that we should assess better. It's not based on uh, concrete data. It's not based uh, on a pragmatic approach. It just really uh, dangerous propaganda. Uh, and clearly, I, I can speak for the European Union. Uh, Last week, uh, uh, the European Commission president presented this uh, uh, Green New Deal uh, that is one of the pillar of uh, her program for the next five years. And I was not surprised in seeing that uh, this is just uh, speculative finance uh, uh, hiding behind uh, uh, sort of green wall. Uh, what will happen on this? Banks will, will speculate on these uh, uh, new uh, instruments, will make profits, will feed a financial bubble, and uh, someone at the end will have to pay the bill of this speculation. And on another, uh, on another point related to, to this Green New Deal, at least the European version is not the European Union uh, today that uh, uh, has to put burden on our enterprises, on our SMEs, on our agricultural sector, on our energy companies, uh, uh, and, and put uh, uh, also treat into our progress because of this fake propaganda. What is in the end for the European Union, this uh, Green New Deal and uh, the so-called attached just transition fund that is a 100 euro billion fund that should help uh, to bankers to make profits <laughs> and uh, uh, people and uh, governments and privates uh, to invest in so-called uh, green projects. That seems to me something similar to the ESM. When Germany was in trouble with banks exposed heavily to uh, Greek debt, they decided to push for this uh, uh, bailout fund that collected taxpayers' money from all the member states and uh, bailed out German banks. And that will happen also with uh, this just transition fund. Germany today has the need to reconvert its industrial system. So these transition funds will collect again money from taxpayers around Europe to pay the industrial conversion of Germany. That's what will happen. And, and that's something that we want to block. We have the duty to try to bring back the debate about climate change to reality, because this is really dangerous propaganda, dangerous schizophrenia that will hurt uh, not just Europe, but the entire world and the progress of our continents and countries in a moment in which we are already experiencing lack of growth. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, I saw that at the Madrid, Madrid conference, which was supposed to collect a global consensus on, on this green transition, uh, likely failed, this conference failed. And, but they came out and accusing four countries, especially the United States, Russia, India, and China. Now, this is not an accident that these four countries have been indicated by Lino LaRouche, whom you have met, uh, as the, the four big powers who can bring peace and cooperation to the world if they come into an agreement. So it's not a coincidence for me that they are singling out these countries 
especially countries like India and, and China, who need to keep their CO2 economy uh, while developing other sources like nuclear energy or fission energy or whatever. Um, what about my other question? Uh, what is the maneuvering room inside European law to to yeah. have national uh, uh, banks yeah, advice you, or protection? You, you, you know that uh, uh, basically uh, from 2008 uh, all the banking regulation in the European Union is drafted at the EU level. Uh, there is no um, uh, exclusive competencies for the European Union in uh, banking and financial regulations. But de facto in the single market uh, is uh, uh, the European Union that uh, has uh, the power or the right to legislate about the banking system. There is possibility for member states to legislate uh, and, and to draft up uh, uh, banking or financial regulation. The Lega had in, uh, in uh, its program in 2018 banking separation. Unfortunately, due to the uh, short uh, duration of uh, our government, we have not been able to tackle this problem and to propose this reform. But this reform, at least in Europe, should not be limited to the national level. It should be developed at the European level because we want to have a common banking market we want to have a, a, a common internal market, so we need good banking regulation at the EU level and good banking separation at the EU level. So it's definitely possible to draft up banking separation at the national level, but it will not be sufficient. We need this bill to be uh, approved and proposed at the EU level for all the EU countries. You think that, that will make our financial system safer because our banks yeah. are deeply interconnected. Right. In the last European Parliament, uh, you didn't have a majority, but uh, you had the possibility and you did stop a, a fake uh, banking reform. How do things look like in the new Parliament? Uh, the situation didn't change... Uh... Um, compared to, to what you are referring, so the so-called banking structure reform bill uh, that was discussed in 2014 in, in the European institution. But I think that at some point in the next five years, the incoming uh, uh, financial crisis will force European legislators to consider banking separation as uh, one uh, strong actions uh, to stabilize uh, and make our financial system safer. But today, I don't see uh, huge space to uh, discuss concretely this kind of reform at the European level. Okay, Marco, thank you for this conversation. I think our time has run out. And now I will close our interview, or at least the legislation, uh, the registration, sorry.